everyone. We're so excited to welcome you back to church next Sunday, the 16th of August at nine o'clock. As you can see, we've got everything ready for you. All you need to do uh, is register online in case you missed that two minute uh, video clip of what to expect uh, when coming to church. Uh, check this out. Great stuff. Hope you enjoyed that. Uh, so remember to register online. Right now, we are going to watch a message by Pastor Heinrich Titus, the leader of Shofar. It's an apostolic message that goes out to all the Shofar churches. So enjoy that. Good morning, everybody. Amazing joy, tremendous privilege this morning to share the Word of God with you. Man, the Word of God, it's alive, uh, it's powerful, it is what the Lord has given us, and our passion for the Word binds us together as well. And we can be connected the way that we are today, here over technology, and uh, on behalf of myself and the rest of the apostolic team, uh, we just want to send you greetings. Um, I hope that many of you, or most of you should know by now that as a Shofar Church family, we are very much connected with one another. Of course, we are part of the, the body of Christ. We are part of the kingdom of God. But the Lord has also placed us within a very particular church family for which we are so thankful. And uh, we have our local congregations and then we have our regions, which is made up out of a cluster of local congregations. And then we're organized into different countries. And then we're bound together by an international apostolic team uh, and I, uh, and not the only apostolic leader. I have the privilege of leading a team of apostolic team members. Uh, from the apostolic team side, we would love to uh, make use of the technology that is available. And whilst we can't travel right now and we can't get to visit you guys, we would really love to just impart a little bit more from our side. And so once a month, you will be getting a message from one of the apostolic team members and it's my privilege to do the message uh, today. And I want to start off by reading for us from Ephesians, the first uh, chapter. But before I do that, 
Let me uh, pray for us. Father, we thank you that today we know we are bound together by your spirit. We are bound together, Lord, by our love for you. We are bound together, Lord, by a purpose and a vision that you have given us to see your name be made glorious, Lord, and the whole gospel taken to the whole world. So Father, thank you for your presence amongst us, Lord, as we have worshiped you and exalted your name, that we can quiet our hearts, we can listen to your word. And God, I pray that your word this morning, Lord, will not just um, be uh, words, Lord, that will stimulate us or maybe entertain us, Lord, but that it will change us and it will transform us. In Jesus' name, amen. And so Ephesians uh, 1 verse 1. Uh, I'm going to read the first two verses of Ephesians 1 for us. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and Paul here, I think if he were to be alive during this uh, day and age, Man, he would have a ball, eh? He would be sending videos everywhere. He would be traveling once the lockdown regulations have been lifted and just trying to get to as many churches as he possibly could. Uh, but he writes to his friends in Ephesus. And the amazing thing about Paul is when he referred to himself, you know, he would talk to uh, about himself as the least of the apostles, the, uh, the least of the saints and uh, the worst of the sinners. But when he spoke about his friends, when he spoke about the disciples, he spoke about the believers, he would be writing to the saints. And, and this is what he does here. He writes to the saints who are in Ephesus. And so this recording, this message goes out to the saints who are in Shofar, South Africa, Shofar, Namibia, Shofar, Malawi, Shofar, Burundi, Shofar, UK, and Shofar, Netherlands, and wherever you might be listening or watching this message. The saints who are in Ephesus, the saints who are part of the Shofar family. And so he's writing to them and this message goes out to the saints, goes out to those who once were strangers, and foreigners um, to the gospel, but who now are part of the household of God. It goes out to those who at one stage were dead in their sin, but now have been made alive in Christ Jesus. It goes out to those who are blood washed, those who are spirit filled, those who once were objects of God's wrath, but now are objects of His affection. It goes out to those who are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who strengthens them. It goes out to those who know that with man things might be impossible, but with God, all things are possible. It goes out to the saints. And so wherever you might be, if you are around another believer, if you are amongst your family who love the Lord, you might as well look to them and say, good morning, saint. I greet you. You might not look like a saint always. You might not act like a saint always. Your breath might not smell too saintly this morning, but you are a saint. You are positioned in Christ Jesus. So greetings to all of the saints in our Shofar family. And he says that he, he gives them and he sends them and he wants to impart to them grace and peace. He says grace to you. And that is what I want to say to you as well. Grace to you and peace from God. Grace. Grace is God's unmerited favor. Grace is God's enabling power. Grace that is made perfect in weakness. Grace that is more than enough for every need that we might have. Grace to you, saint, grace to you. I pray that through this message, through the reading of the word, you will understand that what is available to you is not just a little bit of grace, that in heaven there isn't a drought with regards to grace. You know, these last few weeks or so here in the Western Cape, we have had a downpour. We have had rain upon rain upon rain. Our dams are full, overflowing in certain parts. You know, here in my garden, the water table is so saturated that the water is seeping up from underneath the ground through the surface. And about a year or so ago, we were facing a drought. Things were 
were, were, were hectic. We were losing businesses and, and uh, having to just cut down on water usage. God came through and He rained down mercy upon us. But you know, in heaven, there's never a drought with regards to grace. It is always enough. It is always more than enough. And I want you to know this, that whatever situation you are in, whatever circumstances you are facing internally, externally, grace is available to you. Tap into it. Drink deeply from it. It is God's unmerited, undeserved favor that is available to you. And he continues and he, and he says that I, not only do I want to send you grace from God, but also peace. Peace that is not the peace that the world gives. Peace that is not dependent upon external circumstances, but peace that comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I want to release that over all of us. Grace to you for whatever circumstances you are in and peace from God. Peace from the Lord of peace, shalom to you, shofar, shalom to you. Paul goes, goes on to say a little bit later in Ephesians 1, and I want to read this prayer for you. It's a timeless prayer. It is a, it's a beautiful prayer and it's, it's jam-packed and I will not have time to unpack all of it. But I want to read a couple of verses for you from verse 15 to verse 23. And I'm just trusting God that through the reading of the word, it is going to bring solidity and freedom and healing to our hearts. And, and um, verse 15, Paul says, Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding, being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of His power toward us who believe, according to the working of His mighty power, which He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places." far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. Please take some time over the next few days and just go and meditate upon that. That is, if you, if you don't know what to pray for yourself, like we sometimes do, pray this, pray scripture over you. If you don't know what to pray for someone else, Pray this, pray scripture over a family member, a colleague, a friend. But one thing you will notice here is how often Paul makes mention of him and his. You know, I've been thinking about this. I've been thinking about this, 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 this season, this time in which we live. And, and what I've begun to realize is that I think there's this massive battle raging between us being self-aware, in other words, knowing what are my strengths, what are my weaknesses, what do I like, what do I dislike, what is it that I bring to the table, um, and, and, and what are other people bringing to the table. So being self-aware is important, knowing myself, understanding myself, growing in my self-knowledge, it is important. But I believe that there's a push to push us away from being self-aware into being self-conscious which is different. If you are self-conscious, it means that your, your mind, your, your, your meditation, your perspective is filled with yourself. You know, it's like those of you guys having to do Zoom meetings or Zoom small group, you know what happens. You, you're doing that meeting and man, you're confronted with yourself all the time. You're supposed to wanting to connect with others. You're supposed to be focusing on others and you see yourself all the time. And you literally have to I have to concentrate on, I'm not going to focus on myself now. I'm not going to look at how I look and how I sound and how I come across. I'm going to be focusing on others and listening to others. And the devil is wanting to push us and wanting to get us to become so self-focused, so self-conscious, so self, almost, almost self-obsessed with Man, I've seen some of my weaknesses. I've seen some of the things that are not working out and I have these fears and I have these struggles. And, and this prayer of Paul is so not self-focused. You know, um, 
he just just to give you an an, uh, an inkling, he says um, that God would grant us a spirit of wisdom in the knowledge of Him. Uh, that the eyes of understanding may be opened, that we might know the hope of His calling, the glory of His inheritance, the, the working of His mighty power, which He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand. Um, goes on and He put all things under His feet and gave Him to be head of all the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him. You know, there's very little me in there. It is Him. It is He. And this is my message to us. Shofar, let's resist the temptation. Let's break the shackles of becoming self-obsessed, self-inward focused and gazing just at ourselves. Let's focus our attention on Him. Let's Trust God for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. The greatest gift that we can give to those around us, it's not so much as self-knowledge. It is, it is who we are in Christ. And, and that is what Paul is almost obsessed about in Ephesians, who we are in Christ. It is Him doing the work. It is Him doing the calling. And he prays that his friends will have their eyes opened the eyes of their mind, the eyes of their understanding. And the word there is sometimes translated mind, heart, understanding. It's where we get the injunction from the command to love God with all of our mind, you know. And that deep place, that place that you know you harbor your deepest thoughts, your deepest plans, your deepest convictions, that those things that come out in a moment of pressure, when the pressure is on and, 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 and and you just, boof, you know, it just comes out. This is raw. This is me. He says, I want you to know this in that part of your being. When everything is stripped away, everything is cut off, everything is challenged, everything is shaken in the core of who you are. I want you to know this. He says, I want that part of you when you close your eyes and go to bed, when you wake up in the middle of the night, when you get up in the morning, the first thing that you are aware of, I want light, revelation, light to flood that part of your being. It is that you, you think through it, you meditate upon it, and it defines you. And I want you to be enlightened in that part of your life, that part of your being. And it says, I want you to be enlightened so that, and I love the word enlightened, you know, it speaks of light. Uh, all of us, I think, I found ourselves in rooms where it's, all, it's dark all of a sudden or you want to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night and you don't want to switch on the light to wake up your, your wife or the kids or whatever. And you start knocking things off. You hit your toe against something, especially like in my house, my wife every so often has to move things around and it's not where, where it was uh, previously. Then you, it's like you're all tense. You got to walk slowly. You're not too sure what, what is where. But when the light comes on, man, you've, you, you've got perspective. You can see a straight line. You know where to go. And so the light comes and you can see. But I, I think that word um, enlightened also means that, you know, shackles come off. When you can see clearly, you set free from the fear. You set free from the timidity. You are set free from the intimidation. You literally become lighter. And, and I'm trusting God for us. Shofar Church family, because I believe there's an assignment. And I, I'm speaking for myself here, and maybe some of you guys can relate. Just an assignment that wants us to withdraw, an assignment that wants us to become heavy, an assignment that wants us to, to carry burdens and things upon ourselves that we shouldn't be carrying. And God says, Paul says, I want you to see. I want you to see with, with your, your inner being, you know, beyond the clothes that you wear, beyond the house in which you live, beyond the language that you speak, beyond the nationality on your passport. I want that spirit part of you that cannot be defined, cannot be locked in. I want that part of you to know this so that it translates into your thinking and into your being and into your existence and into your work and into your friendships. I want you to know the hope of His calling. The hope of His calling. You know, and if, and if Paul prays this for his friends, if he prays this for his, his, his believing friends, for his disciples, he didn't pray this for the unbelievers. In another stage, he prays that the eyes of the understanding would be open. They would know God's love and, and all of those things. But here, he's speaking to believers. He, and he's praying for them that the, the eyes of the understanding would be enlightened, would be opened up. You know, the implication of this is that the eyes of our understanding can be darkened, isn't it? 
that the eyes of our understanding can be limited in our perspective. And I, and I believe that, that, that Satan, the devil, the enemy of our souls, he would want to come and he want to prevent us from having enlightened eyes. He would want to come and veil us. He would want to come and have us so self-focused and self-obsessed so that we forget what? The hope of His calling. The hope of His calling. Hope is the fuel that drives humanity. Hope is the fuel that enables us to, to, to imagine a future that is different from the present. Hope is what sets us apart from the animal kingdom. And many, many, many of us have been challenged on our hope. Now, Proverbs speaks about it. Proverbs 13 verse 12 says, hope deferred makes the heart grow sick. I think it's the New King James. It says, makes the heart grow weary. But it says, when hope is delayed, when hope is moved, when hope, you, you went looking for that hope, you went looking for the favorite cup of yours, it's not there anymore. Some of you that work together in an office building, you know, you've got your cup. And then you, somebody moved my cup. You know, it's gone. Or you, you get that favorite thing and it's not there anymore. Some of us, our hope has been moved. You know that, yeah, I'm, I'm making it to the first team. So what? First team sports are not happening. You know, we, our business is going to move to the new premises. It's not happening anymore because the finances have dried up. We're going to sign a business deal. It's not happening anymore because the partner went bankrupt. I'm going to visit my kids overseas. It's not happening anymore because the borders have been closed. Our hope, not bad hope. Real human hope, it has been moved. It has been misplaced. And then what happens? Our hearts become weary. Our hearts become sick. But I believe that God is going to infuse life and hope back into us so that we don't shrivel up and become a hopeless people. So we don't shrivel up and become people that are just simply surviving. He's wanting to kindle hope again. But I love what Paul says. Paul speaks about the hope of His calling. Now, sometimes we can be talking about my calling. It's a great calling and it's an amazing calling. And, and yes, we need to take ownership of that calling, but it is His calling. The calling starts with Him. And look at what Romans 5, verse, verse 1 to 5 says here about, about, about what do we do when our hope gets moved? What do we do when, when things don't work out the way that we've planned them to? What do we do? I mean, as a, as a pastor, I realized these last few days, uh, I actually, I'm, I'm, I'm semi-depressed because I cannot be amongst the congregation, you know, and just hug people at the door and pray with people and worship, worship God together with believers and be on our knees and jump up and down. I've got to find other avenues to feed my soul now. I miss God's people. And I, like, I'm grumpy and I don't understand what's going on. I realize my hope has been moved. I'm not seeing the growth. I'm not seeing the lives being, being impacted and changed. I've got to trust God, what He's doing in the lives of those around me. But I had to recalibrate myself. And Paul speaks to people like me. And he says to me, through Him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, right? It's through faith that grace is made available to us, not through our performance, not through our successes and our achievements. No, it's through faith that we access grace. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. He says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope, and hope does not put to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And so just quickly, Paul is saying, man, you've got to know that your hope is going to be challenged. You've got to know that circumstances are going to come against you, wanting to squash your hope. And you're not special. You're not unique. There's nothing peculiar about you. It has happened to saints right throughout the centuries and it will still happen. But if you want to come out on the other side with your hope stronger, then you have got to embrace those things that are challenging your hope. You've got to see them, look them in the eye and say, I thank you for coming my way because you are giving me an opportunity to come out stronger. But you've got to be honest. I visited friends this, this morning and I just, I was just honest. I said, man, I'm struggling. You know, I could be vulnerable with them and they could pray for me and my hope was kindled because I embraced it. I, I rejoice in it now that I'm being tested. 
I'm being tested in a way that I wasn't tested when we could have the church services. I'm being tested in a way that I wasn't tested before when I could see more people and I could keep my fingers on, on everybody's pulse. I'm being tested now. And I'm rejoicing in this because I know it is working in me and, and endurance. And without endurance, I cannot have hope. Without endurance, I will not have character. Now, Richard Blackerby in his, in his book, Spiritual Leadership, says that it looks almost certain that every significant uh, influential leader has, has had a massive failure, a massive challenge in his life that he had to work through because that shaped him. It built endurance in him and character in him and hope so that when other people's hope fail, he or she has got hope to give. You are in a test, you are in a suffering, embrace it, rejoice in it, say, come here, come closer. I'm embracing you to learn what God wants me to learn. Why? Because hope for us isn't an event. Hope for us isn't in a thing. Hope for us is rooted in the fact that God's love has been shed abroad into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And so that's a hope. It says, man, you can strip me from anything, but God's love has been shed abroad into my heart through the Holy Ghost. Believers, God has shed His love into our hearts so far. That God's love is like a reservoir inside of us. Embrace it, acknowledge it, lean into it again. Don't try and fix the circumstances. Don't try and fix the people around you. Embrace His love and trust Him. He is the author and the finisher of our hope. But He wants to remind us that even the hope of our calling, even the hope of, of, of the fact that there's a destiny for us, hope is a person. Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith is in our midst. And what I'm talking about isn't just a, 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 a flimsy ability to see things through. It's not just, just, just get by. What I, I, I'm believing God is wanting me to exhort you in this morning is there's a hope of your calling. God's calling upon your life. That, 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 that you've got to contend for that. There's a battle that rages for God's calling upon your life. And God is wanting to come and awaken that inside of your heart again. You are more than just the stuff that you are doing. You are more than just what's happening with organizing school life for your kids. You are more than just trying to, 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 to trim the budget so that the company doesn't go under. You are more than all of those things. The hope of His calling, which once burned brightly in your heart. God is wanting to come and rekindle that because when we, when, we, when we have that hope alive inside of us, man, our perspective changes. We've got enlightened eyes. Look at this beautiful Psalm 139. Psalm 139, David writes the Psalm. And David writes the Psalm as a sinner. He writes the Psalm as a man who had to live with the consequences of his own sin, as a man who had to live with rejection from those around him, as a man who was persecuted by the king that he loved and he just wanted to serve. David's life wasn't perfect. David's life wasn't all rosy and, 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 and just, you know, blessed all the time. It was a mess very often, but he had the hope of his calling burning inside of him and it enabled him to say this, my frame, right? my frame, this who I am, what constitutes me was not hidden from you. When I was made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, you knew about me, God. Your eyes saw my unformed substance and in your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. I says that my days were formed by God. Even before I arrived on the scene, plans made for me by God. Hope speaks like that. Hope says, yeah, I'm running from, from Saul, but my days were formed by God. Hope says, yeah, I've messed up, man, and my baby has died because of my sin, but days were fashioned for me. My frame isn't hidden from God. He hasn't forgotten about me. I am still His. And how precious are his thoughts towards me. 
How precious to me, O Lord, are your thoughts. How vast is the sum of the man. Come on, church. God's thoughts are beyond the survival, just getting through COVID, beyond just making it to the end of the, how vast are God's thoughts towards us, the plans that He has for you and for me. They're vast, they're uncountable. May His thoughts be precious towards us again. Galatians 1 verse 15 to 6. And I just want to read a whole bunch of verses for us. Paul says, When God who set me apart from my mother's womb, from my mother's womb, He had set me apart. He had set apart for me a vehicle, a road, a, a, a journey, a destiny for me. Yeah, even when I was growing up as a Hebrew and I was growing up as a Pharisee and I was steeped in the law and I was persecuting God's, God's children, throwing them in prison and maybe even leading to some of their death, God had consecrated me. God had set me apart for a different purpose. He'd set me apart and He called me by His grace. He called me by His grace. God has called you and me. And He revealed His Son in me so that I might preach Him among the Gentiles. I might preach Him among the Gentiles. Before your folks even knew each other. You know, it doesn't matter the circumstances of your birth. God knew you. And God has got a purpose for you. And God revealed His Son to you and to me. Think about it. I mean, the fact that you can listen to this message, the fact that I can, 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 can bring this word to you. God revealed His Son to me, to you. Opened my eyes, my ears, your eyes, your ears. Revealed Jesus to us. Man, we could have been born in a country where nobody knows about Christ. We could have been lost this morning. But God revealed His Son to us. What a treasure. What a gift that you and I have received the revelation of the Son of God and that He lives inside of us. And why did He do that? Why are you a teacher who has a revelation of the Son of God? Why are you an accountant who has the revelation of the Son of God? Why are you a home executive teaching your kids with the revelation of the Son of God living inside of you? Why? Have you ever thought about that? Why? Is it just to go to heaven? Is it just to be with God for eternity? Of course, it's amazing. It's our destiny. And so we don't fear death, but we have received that revelation so that we might preach Him among the Gentiles. We preach Him as we do our books. We preach Him as we teach. We preach Him as we do our graphic design. We preach Him as we build our businesses and the infrastructure because He has called us. Let me, let me, let me pick up, pick up speed. Romans 1 verse, verse 6 to 7. God is, uh, uh, is uh, Paul is speaking to his friends and he said, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. So you have been called to belong to him, not to a political party, not to an ethnic grouping, not to a linguistic grouping, not to even a theological background. You have been called to belong to him. He has put you on his finger as a ring is on his finger. You know, most of us as husbands will know how jealous our wives are over our time. They get jealous over this thing and they get jealous over the work. Why? Because we belong to them. Our hearts, our thoughts belong to them. And I feel so for God is saying, I'm jealous over you because I've called you not to go out there and do a lot of stuff first, not just to get by. I've called you. And I want to rekindle the hope of this calling to belong to me to belong to me. I've been reading this little book, God Smuggler, Brother Andrew, taking Bibles behind the Iron Curtain of the past Soviet Union. A man who lived with a sense of calling, a Dutchman who didn't have a lot of things going for himself except a burning passion to take the Bible somewhere to those who didn't have scripture. He lived with a passion, with a calling. I looked at my own life and said, man, Heinrich, come on. You're going through the motions here. Wake up. God has called you to belong to Him. And so I'm singing that song again, my wife and I sang at our wedding day in Jesus, I would go with you to the ends of the earth and I won't hide it. I won't hide it. And I'm shaking off the shackles and the things that want me to hide it because I belong to Him and wherever He goes, I just want to be there. Wherever He goes, doesn't matter where He takes me. We've been called to be holy. Verse 7 says, To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. We've been called to belong to Him. We've been called to be 
holy. Man, what does it mean to be a saint? It means you're different. It means that you understand there's a fire of holiness burning inside of me. I'm not perfect. I mess up. I do stuff. But when I do it, I want to run back to God. And so shofar, church family, saints who are in shofar, who have been called to belong to God and called to be holy, burn the bridges, man. Put the filter on your phone. Cut, break with whatever you need to break fast, pray, get into a place of saying, God, I want to be holy. Stop listening to the music that causes you to be soulish in your understanding. Get rid of the subscriptions that are pulling you away from holiness because God called us to be holy. Why? Because He wants to blaze His love through us. Not perfect, not getting everything right all the time, but being called to be holy means we are called. <laughs> And as we respond to that call, we walk differently, we talk differently, we sing differently, we love differently. Called to belong to Him, called to be holy so that His love can manifest through us. We are called to be sent once. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 1 and 2. Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. Paul called by the will of God. You haven't been called by the will of man? You don't belong to Heinrich. You don't belong to, to the Shofar Apostolic Team. You don't belong to your pastor. You don't belong to your boss. You don't belong to your kids. You don't belong to your spouse. You have been called by the will of God to be an apostle. What is an apostle? It's a sent one. Come on, church. Shofar, God has called us to go, to go to the nations. That's why we're part of this church, because we've got a calling to take His gospel, take His light to the nations. And now we can't go. And the nations have come to us. The nations are all around us. Wherever you are, you probably have people who are different to you around you. Go to them. Go to them. And if you've got a passion to go to a nation you can't right now, then pray fast. Read up on that nation. Do not allow the calling, the hope of His calling to be a sent one diminished. As you step out your gate and out of your door, you are a sent one going to the neighborhood watch. A sent one going to the uh, a, a police station to take them pizza, a sent one going to clean fire engine or whatever. We are sent ones. Let's live with that calling. And then lastly, I'm trusting God that you and I will walk worthy of the calling. Uh, Ephesians 4 verse 1 says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Let's walk worthy of that calling. That's a man, I, if, if I've allowed things to creep into my heart, if I've allowed this, this world and the spirit of this world to, to contaminate me and to pollute, and I've, I've become bitter towards people, if, if, I've, if, if I've walked away from my calling that God has given me, and all of our callings, they manifest differently in the detail, but the big theme is the same. We are called to belong to Him. We are called to be holy. We are called to go with His love. Let's walk worthy of that calling. And let me finish off by reading this prayer for you from um, 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 11. With this in mind, with all of this that I've said, with this in mind, we constantly, wait, wait, wait. Let, me, let me rephrase that. With this in mind, doesn't talk about everything I've said now. Paul there is saying that one day God will come back, Jesus will come back, and He will exact vengeance upon your enemies. He wants you to remember this, that He is a God of justice. You might be in situations where you think that things are unjust. There are things that are happening that shouldn't be happening. God is a God of justice. Know that. And one day, He's going to exact vengeance upon our enemies. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you. We're praying for you as the apostolic team. We are praying. Ever we come together, we pray for you. And my prayer right now for us is this, that our God may make all of us worthy of His calling and that by His power, He may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. There are desires for goodness. There are dreams that are living within this church family that are not selfish, that are to change the world. And I'm praying that through His power, He will bring that to fruition and that your good deeds may be activated, prompted by faith as you reconnect to the hope of His. It has always been about Him, not about you earning that. 
being able to do it in your own strength. It has always been about Him. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in Him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for my friends listening to this message, Lord, and I pray that you would flood our minds, our hearts, our souls, our spirits with the revelation, Lord God, of the knowledge of you, a spirit of wisdom, Lord, to invade us so we will again have enlightened eyes. Lord, to know the hope of our calling. I pray for those of my brothers and sisters, Lord, whose hearts once burned brightly with the knowledge that you have called them to make a difference, that you have called them to be loved by you, to walk intimately with you, God, but also to live holy lives. Lord, who have lost that the hope of the, the call to be holy because they're so disappointed and feel so ashamed because of their failures and their sins. I pray that you would set them free from that, Lord, and may they once again embrace the calling to be holy. I pray also, Father, they will embrace the calling to be sent once. Unshackle us as a church family, Lord. May we continue to go where you sent us, knowing that your name will be glorified in us and through us. God, as we walk with you, in Jesus' name, amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and peace from God our Father be upon each and every one of you till He returns for us. The Lord bless you. Bye-bye.